across all the different types of organic molecules. Um, we talked about for the majority of them, uh, the functional groups, uh, how to name them, uh, some of the reactions that they undergo. Um, <clears throat> so we're sort of in the middle to the end here talking about our second to last organic group. And we pretty much are down down to nitrogen containing groups. Uh, so that's where we are here with our amines. Amines are nitrogen based groups. Uh, they have a functional group of uh, NH2 as sort of the functional group that's on there. Uh, that NH2 is very similar and sort of a derivative of NH3, which is ammonia. Ammonia is a weak base. And ammonia basically has this sort of uh, structure that we saw earlier when we were doing Lewis structures, uh, like this with our non-bonding electrons on our nitrogen. Uh, our amines also have that sort of general setup here. Um, you know, they kind of have those non-bonding electrons, but connected to really a carbon as well. <clears throat> I believe it's posted last Wednesday's lecture. I'll double check when we're done here tonight, but I think they all should be up there. Um, but again, I'll double check. I think I did already. Um, <clears throat> but just in case I miss it, I'll, I'll double check when we're done. Um, so they do have this sort of thing. So it will be... Um, very much like ammonia and has these non-bonding electrons. So we talked a little bit about these guys as well. Amines last time that you can classify amines as primary, uh, secondary, or tertiary amines. And what we're looking at at that point is the nitrogen. And we're looking at the nitrogen in terms of uh, how many carbons are attached to that nitrogen. Uh, so if there's one carbon directly attached to that nitrogen, uh, it would be a primary. If there's two carbons, it would be a secondary. And if there's three carbons, it would be a tertiary. Um, in terms of sort of naming them, if you will, uh, we sort of follow almost like a, almost like a common name way of naming. It will be sufficient probably for us where we just kind of uh, find the groups that are attached to uh, the nitrogen and basically put them in alphabetical order and then call it basically, for example, ethyl methyl amine is one way of naming it. Um, <clears throat> the more sort of formal way of naming it, as I think we also touched upon last time, uh, was doing something like using N in the name. Uh, so something like N methyl ethane amine. And again, uh, what that means is the group that we're talking about there is actually connected uh, to the nitrogen instead of the carbon. So for example, if we had this guy, I think maybe this one we saw. So sort of a common sort of way to and again, that's our ethyl group. That's our methyl group there. And uh, again, we could go ethyl methyl amine. Um, another, again, very sort of common way that we name it is, uh, or a more formal way of naming it is to take the longer group here, which would be this guy, and basically drop the E and put amine at the end of it. So it'd be something like ethane, uh, amine. And then the shorter group uh, would come in front, and this would be something like N, methyl, ethane, amine, the N meaning again that this group is attached to the nitrogen. So people do use sort of the N sometimes uh, when they're naming amines and amids as well. And again, with the N sort of simple way of thinking about it, the N basically means that the group is attached to the nitrogen. We use numbers when we're talking about groups that are attached to carbon. So that's again, sort of the difference there uh, in that. But for us, I think your book goes with the more uh, sort of group way of naming and we'll go with that as well, which is uh, what we did down over here, the ethyl methyl amine as well. <clears throat> Any questions on the stuff we talked about, I think, last time? Okay. So I think this is where we left off in, in terms of uh, looking at our lecture here. And we're talking about some of the properties of amines. Again, uh, Amines, as we talked about as well towards the end last time, have some properties. Um, they typically have pretty high boiling points as well because they have the ability to hydrogen bond. Uh, so that works. 
and some of them are soluble in water as well because of that hydrogen bonding ability. Uh, but it means uh, they are proton uh, acceptors, which means they do act as bases. So since they really are sort of based off of uh, ammonia, which is a base, just like what we talked about sort of uh, with acid and bases, we are going to get an H plus that's gonna donate over here. In this particular case, the water here would act as an acid. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we will accept it on our NH4, uh, our nitrogen here, gaining that. Again, we make hydroxide here. And this is really why it's considered a base because it does produce hydroxide. <clears throat> so amines can act very much like bases, sort of those proton acceptors like we've uh, seen before in our acid-base conversation. Uh, the acid-base reactions do occur with all the amines, so our primary, secondary, tertiary amines can all basically partake in this. Uh, means are weak bases um, compared to things like sodium hydroxide. Remember things like sodium hydroxide, uh, potassium hydroxide. These guys are strong bases. A lot of times uh, anybody that does have uh, OH in it is still a strong base. Amines also can uh, react with acids. So kind of like how they can react with water, they again could also do sort of that acid reaction as well. Um, so if they react with something like HCl, which is a strong acid, uh, just like we got here, same sort of situation is going to occur. The acid is going to donate over its H plus. It obviously is going to gain that H. And just like what we talked about with acid and bases, in addition, they're also getting the plus. So again, the charge changes overall, and we're left with our Cl minus in this case. Uh, so very, very similar to, again, that sort of gaining of the H plus. When we do react an amine with uh, an acid, we do make what is sometimes referred to as an ammonium salt. And that's really what this whole thing is over here. A salt, if you remember, is the same thing we talked about earlier. It's really just an ionic compound. Uh, so basically what's happening here is uh, when this guy gains that H plus, it becomes positively charged. We obviously make a negatively charged guy. And that's basically what uh, makes a salt that's referred to there. And again, from that same reaction we just saw here, H goes over, pretty much accepts it. Again, not just the H, but the plus as well. And by the way, just like everything else we've been seeing here, absolutely nothing really changes in our original molecule. All that's the same. That's the same, that's the same, that guy and that guy is the same. Again, the only difference is we put the H on. Absolutely everything else remains the same uh, in terms of that reaction. All right, so to name the salt, we don't really care. So we're not gonna worry about naming salts. So you don't have to worry about that at all. Um, but uh, <clears throat> a water insoluble amine uh, is converted to a water soluble uh, with the treatment of uh, an acid. So um, this guy here to start with is insoluble. It's mainly insoluble in water because of the big giant part here that's nonpolar. And that's basically, I don't know, about eight carbons or so. So as we talked about a lot of things in organic chemistry, you know, even though it can do some hydrogen bonding over here, because it has such a big part that's nonpolar, it gets in the way, sometimes again, referred to as steric hindrance, and it makes it very much not very soluble uh, by reacting this here and then accepting that H plus, it is going to make that front part a little bit bigger and a little bit more soluble in water in that particular case. And again, you don't have to worry about naming it or anything like that. Any questions on amines? All right, so that brings us to our very last organic group in chapter 13 and in total, and that is amids. So amids have a functional group that's very much really a combination of a carboxylic acid sort of and an amine. It has a functional group of a carbon oxygen double bond with really like our amine group on there. Uh, so this again is our functional group of our amid. <clears throat> And just like kind of other things that we've seen, uh, we can classify amids as also 
primary, secondary, or tertiary. And again, works the same way as everything else that we sort of classify that way. Again, because it's in the mid here, it's nitrogen containing. We are looking at the nitrogen. And again, directly attached to the nitrogen is one carbon, and that would make it a primary amid in this case. And we also see similar things here. If we look at our nitrogen, again, directly attached to it, one carbon there. Remember that the R here is representative of a carbon containing group. So we basically got two carbons directly attached uh, to the nitrogen. That gives us our secondary. And lastly here, again, looking at our nitrogen, we have one, two, and three carbons directly attached to it, which would obviously give us our tertiary amid. So you can see a lot of things in organic chemistry are sort of classified based on primary, secondary, or tertiary. And again, that's sort of the simplest way to do it is just looking for how many carbons are directly attached to it. So when we go about naming, um, you actually don't have to worry about naming of a mid, so you don't have to worry about the naming, but we'll just talk about just really quickly here since it's on the screen, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but really, like I said, it is sort of from a carboxylic acid and an amine together, and that's basically acetic acid, and that's why it's known as acetamid with the AMID at it. That's a benzene ring basically with our amid group, benzyl amid, and again, you're not responsible for naming of these amids. Amines, yes, but amids, no. Uh, secondary as well, and tertiary, they'll, you oftentimes use that N in terms of the naming. Uh, again, here having a group that's attached to that N, as you can see here, we have the N ethyl uh, form, form of amid, and that's because this is basically formic acid, uh, which is also known as methanoic acid. And again, this is that group that's attached not to a carbon, but to a nitrogen, and that's our N ethyl. Again, you do not have to know the naming of that, just kind of going over it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about physical properties. Uh, primary and secondary amids do have higher boiling points than tertiary amids. And that has a lot to do, again, with sort of the properties that we see with tertiary uh, sort of compounds here. And if we look at this here, uh, we have our ester here, which again is not an amid, but a very similar type of compound, except it has an oxygen involved. And we do see that this is our tertiary amid versus our primary amid. And what we see here is this nitrogen here has a couple of hydrogens, which allows it to do some hydrogen bonding. When we go to this nitrogen, no hydrogens on it. Again, there's three carbons attached to it, basically. So that nitrogen has no hydrogens, and that means it also cannot do any hydrogen bonding. Again, as we talked about with a lot of these organic compounds, the ability to hydrogen bond means that it could hold itself together with itself a lot stronger. But, uh, <clears throat> excuse me can hold itself together a lot stronger, which means what that relates to is you need a lot more energy to break them apart into the gas phase, which is obviously what happens at the boiling point. So here we see our primary mids higher uh, than our tertiary mids, but our tertiary mids still a higher boiling point than our oxygen here uh, in this particular case with our uh, ester. So let's talk about a couple of important sort of reactions that occurs uh, with our amids and we have uh, treatment of amid with water in the presence of an acid uh, catalyst. This is what is sometimes referred to as an acid hydrolysis. Um, acid because obviously an acid's involved here as a catalyst and hydrolysis means it involves water. So that's basically what's happening here. And essentially what happens if we do an acid hydrolysis here is we're going to actually make this whole thing 
is essentially going to come off. This 08 is going to come on. And what we will end up with is a carboxylic acid. So I told you it kind of looks like a carboxylic acid. So by doing an acid hydrolysis here, we can actually get the carboxylic acid back. And again, if you look at it, although it may look really crazy what's going on here, everything is the same in terms of the carboxylic acid. So this entire run right here is exactly the same as right here. We have our exact same carbon oxygen double bond as we do here. Again, the only difference is we put on that OH to make the carboxylic acid. And then obviously our uh, NHCH3 comes off. So that is this part right here. And then we basically regenerate uh, ammonia salt. So we put on a couple of hydrogens in this process and we get this salt. So the process there of the process of doing an acid hydrolysis of an amide is you go for an amide and you basically get back a carboxylic acid in this part. So basically you go from this guy to this guy. Now we also can do uh, this reaction in sort of a base form. And in a base form, we actually don't get back the carboxylic acid. We get back almost the carboxylic acid. So if we do this, which is sometimes referred to as a base hydrolysis, and again, for the same reason, base because sodium hydroxide, for example, is involved here. Hydrolysis, again, because water is involved here. And in this particular case, what's going to happen is uh, we're basically just going to pop this part off and we actually will not get uh, the entire carboxylic acid. We get everything but the hydrogen to come in and we end up with our carboxylate ion, basically, our negatively charged guy. So in the base, we do not get the OH that comes on. It's just the O, but everything else is exactly the same. This entire part right here is exactly the same as it is right here. Only difference is only get the O minus that comes on uh, through this process. And what we get back is basically like ammonia on the back end here. So in this case, we started with our amid and we basically make an anion at that point in this particular case. So that's what we get here when we do our base hydrolysis. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so a lot of uh, amids are, uh, are seen in things like caffeine, nicotine, um, are these nitrogen containing guys, these alkaloids are sometimes called. And again, on the left there is uh, caffeine. On the right there is nicotine. Again, these nitrogen containing guys of amines and amids uh, that are happening. All right, so for amids, uh, again, in terms of what you need to know, you need to know the functional group. Uh, you need to know primary, secondary, tertiary. Obviously you need to know the things about the boiling point and you need to know those two reactions, the acid and base hydrolysis reaction that we just talked about. Again, acid hydrolysis, you get a carboxylic acid. Base hydrolysis, you don't get the completed carboxylic acid, you get the anion, the negative we got. Uh, again, no naming on this guy. So you don't have to worry about no naming on emits. But again, a means you do need to know the names and everything else that we talked about. Any questions on that? That actually should be it for organic chemistry. So that is the end of chapter 13. It is also the end of the material that will be on uh, exam three, which again has been moved to one week from today, I believe. So one week from today, we will take it and again, it'll cover um, <clears throat> all the organic chapters, including uh, chapter eight, which was the acid and base. So 
you will need a calculator for chapter eight type stuff. Again, that was the pH stuff, uh, the pOH, OH minus, H plus, that kind of stuff. And obviously no real need for a calculator for any of the organic stuff, but you do need to obviously be able to name things, draw things, uh, draw products of reactions, you know, all that stuff that we talked about. Any questions on any of that there? Uh, can you go back to the reaction of the amine with the sodium hydroxide real quick? Yeah. Um, can you explain like how we get those uh, carboxylate ion again? Yeah, so uh, what actually happens, there's a, there's a few step process that sort of happens. Uh, and again, a lot of these things, we just kind of see the uh, end result of it, if you will. We don't really talk, get into the details of how everything is sort of formed. There's actually a lot going on in, in sort of this process as well. What actually ends up happening is uh, the OH minus actually kind of comes into the carbon here and it attaches to the carbon at that point. And then the hydrogen from that OH actually comes over here and that causes that part of it to sort of break off. And that's why we end up with just the O minus in this particular case. And that's how the hydrogen sort of gets back over here. So there's a lot, trust me, there's a lot of uh, way outside of this class, but there's a lot of things known as mechanisms of how these things sort of occur. And sometimes, a lot of times what happens um, when you have something that has that carbon oxygen sort of double bond is this is that polar sort of guy, this is more positive. So sometimes what happens is negative things like the hydroxide will actually come in and attach temporarily here and it'll actually break that double bond into a single bond. And it allows sometimes other things to kind of move around. And there's points along the way where all these things are connected kind of to it at once. And then you get sort of this transfer that occurs and it, it causes certain things to leave, which is sometimes known as a leaving group. And it makes this guy kind of like a leaving group sort of attached with the extra hydrogen over there. And that OH that came in kind of transfers this hydrogen over there in that process. So again, there's a lot in all these sort of reactions that we saw. It's really not as simple as like, hey, take this off and put this on. There's a lot of steps that actually occur, you know, sort of along the way to get you to that final product. It's just sort of outside of our class in terms of, you know, things that you need to know and stuff like that. But a lot of times, a lot of times when you do have that carbon oxygen, a lot, a lot of action sort of in those reactions or mechanisms occur with something sort of attaching there. And then at that point, you get kind of like intermediate where you got a lot of things sort of in transition happening. And then things sort of sometimes hydrogen sort of transfer over, uh, even sometimes things like over here up on top, when that happens, you know, water will sort of be made and then water will kind of pop off. And that's how in some of these reactions, we get things like water shows up and things like that. Other questions? Um, so basically an AOH here, the role here, it just, uh, telling us that it's in the basic condition? Yeah, it's, it's in the base. Yeah, the NAOH here is really for basic conditions. Um, by doing that as well, we get a lot of OH minus from the water, but it also also adds a little bit extra OH minuses in there. And those are good, what are referred to as sort of, uh, those are good groups that like to attack or attach to this carbon. So it just sort of helps the reaction occur a lot quicker than waiting for enough OH to come from the water part of it. And that's really why it's sort of a catalyst in this case. And kind of the same idea over here, you know, instead of sort of waiting for some of this hydrogen to kind of from the water to do that, we, we, it sort of helps increase the amount that's there and allows the reaction to occur a lot faster. And it just creates those kind of conditions where there's a lot more H plus in there. And like the NaOH creates conditions where there's a lot more OH minus, which in terms, like I was talking about in the mechanism, you know, there's a lot and kind of needed for that to sort of occur efficiently in the products that occur. Other questions on that? So basically, um, can you go back? Yeah. Uh, so right here, if we write in the carboxylate ion, if we attach an, the Na to the O minus, is, is it wrong when, when we write it out like that? No, so sometimes you'll see it, um, you know, sometimes you will see people just kind of write, um, oops, O and then like Na. Technically it's not wrong, but usually in this case, a lot of times people will kind of include the charges if that's what you're sort of asking. Uh, because technically speaking, they're not really, attached to each other, like sharing electrons. They're like an ion basically, right? And ions really aren't sharing electrons. 
So these two guys are technically sort of separated from each other in the solution. Uh, just like if you have sodium chloride and, and water or something, technically speaking, they're not attached to each other. Technically, you have sodium ions floating around and chloride ions floating around. And it's the same idea here. Technically, in this solution, you have this entire thing kind of floating around, and you really have this thing floating around. But we kind of put them together to balance off the charge and stuff like that. And, and that's essentially what's known as a salt, right? It's a positive and negative guy together. And, and that's why, um, you know, most of the time people, especially in these organic guys, they'll kind of draw it or put it like that with the charges. You know, if you wrote it like this for us, it'd probably be okay. But usually people will include it like that. Again, it's just sort of imply that really there's no sharing of electrons sort of happening here in their ions. Other questions? So that does wrap up uh, chapter 13. Like I said, that wraps up the organic. So we're now down to the final three chapters here to go. Uh, so we're gonna talk about carbohydrates, uh, lipids and proteins. So what we're gonna talk about now, which is chapter 14. Again, the slides should be up online if you need them. And um, we will probably not out of these uh, three chapters here at the end, talk about every single thing that's in your book. Uh, so definitely whatever we sort of talk about here in lecture, you are responsible to know it probably will show up somewhere maybe on the final. Um, but uh, again, we may not talk about everything. So, you know, if I say you should know it, it probably means again, probably will find its way to the final maybe in some form or there's a pretty good chance of it. All right, so we're gonna talk about carbohydrates, which looks like bread, pasta, just in time for dinner. That's good. And basically uh, carbohydrates, right, are basically guys that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? So they're really compounds or molecules, if you will, uh, that contain those sort of three elements. Um, they're also sometimes referred to as sugars, as we will see. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is chiral molecules. And chiral molecules are molecules that basically have the same number of atoms, but they're arranged differently in space. Uh, they're essentially isomers. So they're very much like what we talked about in organic chemistry. Uh, they're guys that basically have the same molecular for formula, but uh, sort of a different connection. Um, they have one or more chiral carbon typically uh, in terms of these guys. And what that means is if you look at a carbon, for example, in a carbohydrate, uh, and it has basically four different groups attached, that means it will be a chiral carbon and that guy will be a chiral compound. What does that mean? It means if you have a chiral compound, basically if you take the mirror image of that compound, which basically means you just kind of roll it up to a mirror and you look at the image that's looking back at you and you pull that image out of the mirror, it will not superimpose on each other, which means you cannot make it fit perfectly. The example there is our hands, right? If you put your hand up to a mirror, what's looking back to you is, you know, your other hand basically. But if you take the hand out of the mirror, no matter how much you rotate your hand, no matter how much you twist your hand, you cannot get the original image and the hand that you pulled out of the mirror to fit on top of each other perfectly. Uh, if you do it like this, you go, they fit, they don't because one's palm up, one's palm down. Um, you know, if you flip it around the other way, your thumbs are on the wrong side. So they'll never be able to kind of fit perfectly if you hold your hand up to the mirror and you take that image out and try to get it to fit perfectly right on top of each other. Again, thumbs on the right side, palms going in the same directions. You could try it yourself, just don't injure yourself, twisting your hands, but you probably will not be able to get it to fit perfectly. I don't think so. Um, so mirror images um, <clears throat> that you cannot superimpose on each other are what are referred to as chiral compounds. Uh, so for example, here, if we look at this sort of simple compound, we have our carbon in the middle and attached to this carbon is one, two, three, and four different compounds, uh, which means if we put a mirror up here, as we can see here, what is staring back at us is this guy right here. And just so you can see how you do that, right? 
this guy would be front, this guy would go here, this guy goes here, and this back guy goes to the back. And if we pull this mirror image out, no matter how you twist it, how you turn it, things will not line up correctly in all four spots. Again, as you can see here, we could get the hydrogens, we could get the carbons, we could get the iodines all to kind of line up, but we cannot get these guys to line up correctly. And that would make it, again, a chiral molecule is something that will not superimpose on its mirror image. Now, when we can take a mirror image and actually get it to superimpose on each other, that creates another type of sort of structure. And that is what is referred to as being achiral. So achiral guys means that if you take the mirror image, you can get it to superimpose on itself. So here's again, our original guy. This is our mirror image. And this is an achiral carbon because when we look at it, there is different, 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 but same. So we do not have four different groups attached to it. So it makes it an achiral compound. And what that means is if we take our mirror image, which would be this guy out of the mirror, we are able to really spin it around or rotate it in such a way that everything fits perfectly on each other. And that is means our mirror image is uh, superimposable and that would be an achiral molecule. And it's able to do that really because it has two groups that are kind of the same. And that allows it as you're rotating it to really fit okay on top of each other. So chiral basically means four different groups, non-superimposable, Images, mirror images. Achiral is opposite of that pretty much. You do not have four different groups attached to the carbon. You do have a mirror image that you can superimpose. Here are some everyday chiral and achiral objects. We got our left and right hands, kind of like our mirror image. We have our golf club, uh, which is chiral as well. Uh, we have a chiral guy here is glass and right hand of scissors is also being chiral as well. All right. So take a second here and decide are these chiral or a chiral? See what you come up with. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So again, we're trying to determine if it's chiral or achiral. So again, a reminder that if it is chiral, what that means is you will have a carbon and attached to that carbon is four different groups. If it's achiral, you will have a carbon that is basically not having four different groups. So in that, if we look at A, for example, here, we look at A, attached to this carbon is a chlorine, which is different than a methyl group, that is different than an ethyl group, and that is different than a hydrogen here. So in this very first one here, we actually do have four different things attached to that carbon. And that carbon would be referred to as a chiral carbon. 
And because that's a chiral carbon, that means that this molecule would be a chiral molecule. And what that means is if you took the mirror image of that, so if you kind of push that up in front of a mirror and you took that mirror image out of the mirror, it would not superimpose perfectly on top of each other. So you could not get it to basically be perfectly aligned with each other if you took the mirror image out. Looking at our second one here, again, we're looking at the carbon. We have a chlorine, which is different than a methyl group, and that is different than a hydrogen. But problem here, we have another hydrogen, and that is not different than this hydrogen. So in this particular case, because we have four groups that are not different, we obviously have two hydrogens that are the same, that would make this an achiral compound. That would also mean, again, what that means is if we push this molecule up to a mirror and we took the image that we see in the mirror out of the mirror, we could rotate it around enough to get it to fit perfectly on top of each other. The original guy and the mirror image will fit perfectly on top of each other. And lastly here, if we look at this carbon at the end, we have a chlorine, which is different than a methyl group. That is different than a bromine. And that is also different than a hydrogen. So this is, again is four different groups that are attached. And that would mean that that's a chiral carbon. And this compound would then be chiral as well. Any questions on any of those there? All right, so what we see here. So let's talk a little bit about some different ways that we sometimes draw uh, carbohydrates or just in general. Uh, sometimes Fisher projections are used and these are sort of two-dimensional representations uh, of a three-dimensional sort of molecule. We typically place the most oxidized group up on top. Uh, we use vertical lines and dashes. Um, wedges to show bonds that are coming forward. So here's sort of an example of that as well. But most of the time, although we do see wedges and stuff like that, again, mean that they're coming forward. Most of the time we probably will see things kind of drawn like this. And that's basically a lot of the ways that we see carbohydrates drawn, almost just like a straight line with other lines kind of coming through it. You know, maybe there are some OHs here. And this is a very common way. Obviously there's no wedges or dashes like we see here. Again, dashes, I mean, they're coming backwards. This guy, they mean that they're kind of coming forward, but more commonly we'll kind of draw them like this. And when you see something drawn like this, it's almost like uh, line structure, sort of organic chemistry. Uh, this is obviously a carbon, as you can see here. But pretty much wherever these lines intersect is a carbon. So this would be a carbon. Uh, this would be a carbon. And this would be a carbon. And obviously, this is a carbon as well. Uh, so that's a very common way that we oftentimes will see these sort of carbohydrates drawn. Uh, they obviously won't draw in the carbons like I did there in red. Uh, they'll just kind of draw the lines. You need to know that, you know, those are all carbons. And it's important because a lot of stuff we're going to talk about here has to do with sort of counting the carbons and figuring out where the carbons are. We also see up here, this is just like in organic chemistry, our aldehyde group. And that is the most oxidized group there. It has oxygen in it, typically found up there on the top um, with that carbon oxygen double bond. We also, when we talk about sort of carbohydrates, we also sometimes assign other notations to it, uh, sort of like isomers almost. Uh, and these are D or L. Uh, D for the most part means right. L basically means left. And what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about basically the last chiral carbon 
from the carbon oxygen double bond, what side the OH is on. So basically when we talk about kind of D or L, D again meaning right, L meaning left, we want to find that last chiral carbon and which side that OH is on. So if we look at this very simple one, remember that where this guy crosses, that is a carbon. And the furthest away from that carbon oxygen double bond would be this guy. And the OH is on the left, so that is L. Over here, again, this is the same guy, same guy, exact same carbons, everything else, except our OH is on the right here, and that would be our D. So is that the last chiral carbon? Well, how do we know, you know, that is a chiral carbon and the other ones are not? So let's take a look at that. So for example, if we look at this carbon here, the hydrogen is one group that's attached to it. This entire thing would be two groups attached to it. The OH obviously would be three groups attached to it. And this entire thing would be four groups attached to it. So you may ask yourself, what about the carbon at the very bottom? So if we do the carbon at the very bottom, I'm just gonna draw that. So this, I'll do the guy on the right there. So our guy on the right looks like this. And we'll just kind of draw everything out so you can kind of see it. And if we came down this way, technically, if we drew it out, it would look something like this. So if we look at that last carbon, now that we sort of drew it out, it has uh, one group here. This entire thing coming all the way up here would be considered one group. So that is different, obviously. We have a hydrogen here, but just like we saw previously, we have another hydrogen attached to it. So this would not be a chiral carbon. This would actually be a achiral carbon. Again, it doesn't have four different groups attached to it. It has three, it only has four. And in most cases, I won't say 100% of the time, but 90 some odd percent of the time, when you're dealing with carbohydrates and they're drawn like this, almost 90 some odd percent of the time, even maybe higher than 90, that carbon right above that CH2OH is probably your last chiral carbon. Again, it won't mean, it won't always be 100% of the time, but pretty often it is that carbon that's usually right above that CH2OH type group. Any questions on that? All right, so take a second here, we wanna know, can each of these pairs, uh, mirror image cannot be superimposed. So which one cannot be superimposed? All right, so take a second or two and try to decide. All right, so what we really kind of want to determine probably in this case is, you know, are we dealing with a chiral molecule, which again means that we cannot superimpose our mirror image. Are we dealing with an achiral guy that you can superimpose your mirror image? So let's just start with this guy here. Uh, this guy's a carbon, it's got one group here that is different than this group, that is different than this group, that is different than this group. So this guy would be a chiral molecule. And that means that its mirror image is not superimposable. And by the way, the mirror would be like right about here. 
And again, when we look at it, this guy would be in the front, this guy would be coming this way, this guy would be there, and this guy at the back end would end up over here if we kind of put it in front of the mirror. And on the bottom here, we have a carbon that has a chlorine that's different than a methyl, that's different than a hydrogen. But again, just like we've seen a couple of times at this point, these two guys are the same, which means that this would be a achiral molecule. And that means that you can superimpose. Again, if you want kind of the mirror image, the mirror would be right here. Again, this guy comes up in front. This guy goes to the back, down and down in terms of the reflection that occurs. So uh, to answer the question, it's asking which one cannot be superimposed. So it actually would be this one cannot be superimposed. This one on the bottom can be superimposed. Any questions on that there? And again, that's why it says yes on the answer there, because the top one can be superimposed in that particular case. All right, any questions on chiral, D or L? Then let's talk a little bit more about carbohydrates. As I, meant as I said before, it's a major source of energy in our diet. When we eat, uh, <clears throat> uh, the why your question is why can uh, the why cannot the bottom one why can't the bottom one be superimposed? The bottom one uh, can be superimposed. Actually, this one, yes, it is superimposed. The question itself was kind of worded weird the way they asked it. They want to know which one cannot be superimposed. So that's why it says yes. The first one cannot be superimposed. Second one can be superimposed. So that's why it's yes and no here because of the way the question is actually worded. It's not meaning yes, that the top one can be superimposed and the bottom one cannot. Is yes to that question actually, which is kind of the opposite of what you're thinking here. All right, so uh, carbohydrates, again, uh, basically composed of, um, <clears throat> is basically composed of uh, sugars. Uh, they're sometimes referred to as sugars, which is carbon, hydrogens, and oxygens, all our good stuff, bread and stuff like that. Uh, so carbohydrates um, <clears throat> are produced through photosynthesis. Um, such as glucose is synthesized from CO2 and water. Like I said before, when we do eat things, right, it goes through uh, glycolysis and we use that sugar for energy. We also store some of it. So in case we need to use it later on, we go through what is known as gluconeogenesis where we break it back down into sort of carbohydrates. Now, there are different types of carbohydrates that we will see uh, in this question in this uh, chapter here. Uh, we have monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. So sort of the simplest basic units of carbohydrates are what are referred to as being monosaccharides. And disaccharides basically are two monosaccharides that are basically put together, as we can kind of see here, basically two of them stuck together. Polysaccharides is just a bunch of them stuck together. How we sort of stick them together is basically we take out water and squish everybody together. So um, that's why we do see water here. So H2O comes off between two monosaccharides and we make a disaccharide and polysaccharides. These are just a whole bunch of bonded guys that result from basically removing water and squishing everybody together. That's also if we wanted to go the opposite way we would add water to it and it breaks it into its monosaccharides. You add the appropriate amount of water. So let's talk about each of these sort of individually a little bit. Uh, let's first start with monosaccharides. So monosaccharides will contain probably typically three to six carbons. Uh, they typically will have that carbonyl group on it. So a reminder that when we talk about the carbonyl carbon, it is the same thing that we saw in organic chemistry it is our carbon oxygen double bond, and that's our carbonyl carbon. And it typically will contain either the aldehyde group 
are the ketone group. So a reminder that the aldehyde group is the exact same thing that we saw in organic chemistry. So our carbohydrate will have this carbon hydrogen double bonded H or it will have a ketone group, which is the same one as we talked about as well in organic chemistry, a three carbon run with the carbon oxygen double bond there at the end or in the middle of those three carbons. And they typically will be put kind of at the top of the, of the carbohydrate, you know? So if you have this, you will have something up on top, which has our aldehyde group. Now, be just like in organic chemistry, that carbon oxygen double bond in the ketone uh, group would also need to be not at the top. And that is because you need that three carbon run. So those guys will look a little bit different. They typically will have these CH2OH groups on both ends and this and some of this action here. And again, this is one carbon here. This is two carbons here. And this is three carbons here. So that is kind of like your ketone group right there. Your three carbon runs to the side, uh, given your ketone, just like what we see in organic chemistry uh, in here. <clears throat> We also can classify these monosaccharides based on the number of carbons that there are. Um, so they can be a triose, a tetrose, a pentose, or a hexose. And very much like organic as well, those sort of prefixes, very similar. Triose, tri for three, like tetra for four, penta for five, hexa for six. And this is what is sometimes referred to as an aldose. And what that means is that sort of functional group on it is our aldehyde. So that's our aldehyde group. And hence it is known as an aldose here. It's basically a carbohydrate that has the aldehyde group up on top. This particular guy here would be one carbon. So we would want to have this carbon, two carbons, three carbons, and four four carbons here. So this guy would be a tetros, again, meaning that it has four carbons. It would also be an aldose because it has the aldehyde group that's basically up on top. Just like in organic chemistry as well, if we look at something like this, um, where we have that bond up there, just kind of draw something real quick we would give the numbering the priority here. So this guy here, where that carbon oxygen double bond would get the smallest number. So that would be carbon one, this would be carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five in my made up example. So we would very much like an organic wanna give that carbon hydrogen, a carbon oxygen bond, double bond there, the kind of number one in terms of the numbering. So we also have ketoses, uh, which surprisingly, like the name implies, has the ketone group. So again, as I drew on the one I did, if you look right about here, that is our three carbon run right there. Basically one, two, and three. That is our ketone group. And again, that is what is known as a ketose. And we could do the same thing in terms of num our carbons. This would be carbon, one, two, three, four, five, and six carbons, which is why it's a hexose. And in terms of numbering, we would start at the top here. This would be carbon one, and the carbon oxygen double bond would be carbon two in that case. This would obviously be carbon three, four, five, and six in terms of how we would go about sort of numbering that as well. Um, same idea again, our triose, tetros, and hexos um, because of its arrangement. Any questions on that? All right, so why don't you take a second here and see what you come up with in terms of this? <clears throat> 
Okay, so let's take a look and see uh, what we got going on here. So first off, we want to really know is it an aldo or a ketose. So it's an aldose or a ketose, and really we can determine that from this top group here. So what we see here that looks very much like our aldehyde group, which means this should be an aldo because of that. In terms of carbons, uh, we would go one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons and six carbons, which means this would be a hexose. And uh, over here, uh, again, we see our three carbon run with our double bonded guy there on the second carbon. So that is a ketone group, which means this should be a keto or ketose. And it has one, two, three, four, five carbons, which means this should be a pentose in that case. Any questions on those there? While we're at it, take a second and decide, are the guy, is the guy on the left a D or an L? And is the guy on the right D or L? And also how many chirocarbons are there in both. So why don't we take a second while we got these pictures here. How many chirocarbons are actually in both of these guys? And is it D or L? So take a minute or two here and sort of figure that out for yourself. Okay, so let's take a look. So let's just take a look at all the carbons we got going on. So let's take a look at the, uh, let's actually number it real quick here. So if we were to number this, this would be carbon one, this would be carbon two, this would be carbon three, carbon four, carbon five, and carbon six coming down there. So first off, if we look at carbon one, it has, uh, you know, it's got an O got an H, and then technically speaking, this whole thing would be a group. That is only three groups. That is not four groups. So that is not a chiral carbon. So that first one is not a chiral carbon. Let's take a look at carbon number two and see if it's chiral. So that's an OH group, which is different than the hydrogen. That is different than this aldehyde group. And this entire thing coming all the way down, it's a whole group. So that is four groups that are different, and that would be a chiral carbon in that particular case. So carbon number two is a chiral carbon. Again, all four of these things are different. So two is, let's take a look at three. Carbon number three has one group here, two groups here. This entire thing is a group, which is different than this entire thing, which is a group. And that would also be a chiral carbon as well. So carbon number three would be chiral. 
carbon number four, that is different than the H. This entire thing would be different than everything else above it. So carbon number four would also be chiral because of that. And lastly here, almost lastly, we have carbon number five to look at. Carbon number five has an OH and H. Everything above here would then be considered a group together, which is definitely different than what is there. So carbon number five would be chiral as well. And lastly, carbon number six. Carbon number six would not be chiral. It would be achiral because really we have two hydrogens. So kind of like I drew earlier, those two hydrogens are the same group, so it cannot. So in this particular case, in terms of chiral carbons, just so you understand that there can be more than one chiral carbon in a compound, uh, number two would be chiral, number three would be chiral, number four would be chiral, and number five would be chiral here. Uh, so this particular compound has four different chiral carbons. So to determine if it's D or L, we want to go the furthest chiral carbon from our carbon oxygen double bond, which would be this guy. And we see that the OH is on the right hand side. So this would actually be the D isomer because of that. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So if we do sort of the same deal on a guy on the right, this can be one, two, three, four, and five. And we kind of take the same approach, just like what we saw at the very end there. Carbon number one will not be chiral because this is the exact same deal that's happening here. Carbon number five will also not be chiral as well because of the same thing as what we saw in the previous one. Carbon number two will not be chiral, kind of the same thing. We have an oxygen, CH2OH on top, and everything else on the bottom, which is only three groups. So that really leaves us chiral number three, which we have an H, an OH. We got this entire group and this entire group, which are four different groups attached there. So carbon number three would be chiral. Carbon number four would also end up being chiral. So one, two, this whole thing would be three and four. So in this particular one, there is actually only two chiral carbons and a few achiral carbons. The two chiral carbons would be carbon three and carbon four in this case. Again, carbon number four is the furthest carbon down the road from our oxygen double bond carbon oxygen double bond. And again, we see the OH on the right-hand side. So this guy as well would be D. Any questions on looking at that? So it's a good reminder that sometimes people think there can only be maybe one chirocarbon in a compound or, or a carbohydrate, but a carbohydrate can have, as you can see here, a number of different chirocarbons. Again, when we're trying to do DRL, we want the one that's furthest away from the carbon oxygen double bond and which side the OH is on. Any questions on that there? All right, so let's talk a little bit about these structures of uh, these carbohydrates. Again, we usually use sort of these fissile projections where we really don't write the carbons in. A lot of it is sort of those lines that cross. Again, very similar to sort of organic chemistry uh, when we do that. And obviously here, like I said, in most cases, not 100% of the time, but in most cases, you could kind of go right above it. And it usually is your last chiral carbon. May not always be the case, but a lot of times it is. And again, here we have our OH on the left and our OH on the right on this guy, which is our D orientation, like we talked about. All right, so we got some uh, compounds here. Uh, we got D-glucose, we have D-ribose and D-galactose. Just put a star on this page. You do need to know name and structure for these guys, yeah? So you do need to know pretty much this slide here to make sure that you do. Let's just dissect a little bit of what we got going on here. We see our aldehyde group, so this is an aldose. 
glucose. Um, it has uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six carbons. It's also a hexose. And it is D because this is our last chirocarbon and our OH group is over here on the right-hand side. So this would be D-glucose. Again, name and structure you do need to be familiar with. So again, put a star on this slide. You need to need to know these guys. Uh, this is D-ribose, which you also need to know. Again, we have our aldehyde group here, which makes it an aldose. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons, which means it's a pentose. And also, again, on our very last chirocarbon, on the right-hand side there is our D sort of formation of it. And lastly here, galactose, also an aldehyde group. One, two, three, four, five, six, also a hexose. Also in this case, last chirocarbon OH group is on the left-hand side. So it is a L in this particular case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> the D glucose, if we put the OH group on the on the left, on the other one, on the other side, it, it's gonna be naming as L glucose, right? Exactly. So if you're talking about the, the one that's in the box over here, if we swap that to the other side, it would be then become the L, just like uh, over here with the galactose. The last one's over there on the left-hand side, so that's L. And if you swap that to the right-hand side, it would then be D. So that would be the only major difference between sort of the L and the D for these guys. It's just, you know, which side it's on in terms of that last chirocarbon uh, OH group. Other questions? Uh, is it possible to write it in horizontal like line except? Yeah, I technically, uh, yeah, you, you technically could draw it any, any way you want. You know, most people draw it like we see on the screen, kind of standing up, if you will. Um, it's not technically wrong if you kind of draw it on a side, for, or, you know, like you laid it down. We're actually going to do something where part of the step to uh, turn this into like a ring structure, you kind of drop it on a side. So. You can, uh, but I would say probably just by convention, most of the time people will sort of draw it like we see it on the screen, sort of vertical, I guess is the way to describe it that way. But it's not, I wouldn't think it's technically wrong if you just kind of drew it you know, down or something like that. Um, if we draw it on the other way, it's gonna be like, we gonna consider it's still left and right, but it's just top and bottom. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna actually see that when we, we talk about kind of drawing it into a ring structure. Like uh, when you drop it down, you know, kind of everything on the left goes up, right? Everything on the right uh, goes down. And that's the same idea, yeah, up or down in that case, yeah. And you would want to keep that, obviously, if you drew it down like that, you would want to, obviously, if it was L, you would want to keep that OH up. And, and if it was R, uh, D, you would want to keep it down. Thank Other you. questions on that? <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's see here. So again, this one, you do kind of need to know what's on here, both structure and relationship uh, to the name of it. I would probably say uh, you probably may, you would probably not be asked to draw it necessarily, uh, but if you were given the structure, you need to be able to recognize that it's like D-glucose or, you know, D-ribose or, you know, something like that, or even L-glucose or, you know, I don't know. All right, so take a second here and identify, are these uh, DL? Also, while we're at it, why don't we make sure, why don't we identify them as trios, hexos, pentos, those guys, and are they an aldose or a ketose? So take a couple of sec minutes here and figure out DL, hexos, pentos, aldose, ketose, all that stuff. And while you're at it, figure out how many chirocarbons does each of these have as well. That's a good thing to figure out as well. 
Okay, so let's see how we're doing. So looking at the first one, um, <clears throat> we'll just start with uh, it is a aldose because of our aldehyde group that's there. It has uh, one, two, three, four, and five carbons, which means it's a pentose. Now uh, let's talk about chirocarbon. So this would be carbon one, this would be carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, carbon five. Carbon one is not chiral because it doesn't have four different groups. Carbon two is chiral, I'll just put a check mark. Again, it has four different groups, the hydrogen, the OH group, the aldehyde group, and everything that comes underneath carbon two. Carbon three is also chiral. Again, the hydrogen group, the OH group, everything that comes above it and everything that comes below it. Carbon four is also chiral. Same reason as the H, the OH, everything that comes above carbon four, everything comes below carbon four. And carbon number five is not chiral, it's achiral. It has two hydrogens attached to it. So it has three um, chiral carbons. So we're looking for the last chiral carbon from this C double bond O. And we see that the OH group here is on the left. So this should be L in this particular case. Coming over here, again, we see our aldehyde group. So that's an aldose. This is gonna be carbon one, that would be carbon two, that would be carbon three, that would be carbon four. So that's gonna be a tetros because of it. Again, carbon one, not going to be chiral. Carbon two will be chiral. It does have four different groups. Carbon three as well. Carbon four, not. So same idea, we're going from that carbon oxygen double bond to the last chiral carbon down the road. And our OH group here is on the left. So this guy would also be L as well. And lastly, uh, we have actually our ketone group here. So this would be a ketose. Again, this is one carbon, two carbons, three carbons in a row with the double bond on the second carbon. Um, and we have carbon one, carbon two, carbon three. This then would be carbon four. That would be carbon five. That would be carbon six. And that's a hexose. And in terms of chiral, uh, carbon one would not be chiral. It's got two hydrogens. Carbon two would not. It doesn't have four groups. Carbon three would be chiral. Carbon four would also be chiral and carbon five would be chiral, it's a bad check mark, and carbon six would not be chiral. So in this particular case, furthest away from the carbon oxygen double bond, again, takes us to this guy, and our OH group here is on the right, so we are looking at D in this particular case. Any questions on any of those there? <clears throat> agrees with us. That's good. All right. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about these different uh, carbohydrates. Again, as I mentioned before, you do need to know glucose's structure. Also, like I said before, you probably will not be asked to draw it, but it may be given to you and you need to be able to recognize it as being glucose. So you started early, you started that page earlier. You may want to start one more time here again for that. Uh, these are found in uh, Glucose is found in fruits, uh, corn syrup, honey. Uh, it has a general form of C6H12O6. Again, carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. It's known as blood sugar, right? Um, it's a monosaccharide and a lot of polymers of starch. So put in together a lot of glucose units, taking out water and sticking them all together. Gives us a lot of other sort of carbohydrates like starch, also things like um, our disaccharides and stuff like that. We also uh, sometimes measure glucose uh, in the body, right? And uh, normal levels when this was made was 70 to 90. And we have our other ter terms, kind of like what we saw earlier uh, in terms of hypotonic, hypertonic. So hyper, right, means greater than, so higher blood sugar, right? Hypo means less than, so lower blood sugar uh, in terms of that. 
obviously that can cause an impact if your body can't handle all that blood sugar or do something with it, which is probably why you maybe have higher blood sugar. D fructose, which again is another structure that you do need to be able to recognize. And as I said before, again, maybe not draw, but be able to recognize it. Again, this is a keto hexose, our ketone group right here. And hexose again, meaning six carbons. So again, it has pretty much the same molecular formula as glucose, C6H12O6. It's the sweetest carbohydrate it's found in fruit juice and honey. In the body, it will convert into glucose. And our other one that we talked about knowing uh, is galactose. Also, again, with the same molecular formula. Also, a aldose, because of our aldehyde group that is right here up on top. Um, not found in uh, free nature. Is obtained from lactose. So it's part of what makes up lactose. Very similar in structure to glucose, except on carbon number four, which would be right here. That's carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, which would be this carbon. Uh, the OH group is on a different side. So again, those three guys, you do need to know, like I said, be able to recognize the structure of those guys and the names that go with it. All right, so again, this is our structure, how we typically would draw uh, what we have there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of our fructose, again, numbering wise, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Any questions on that so far? I think we will stop there today since we'll need definitely a little bit more time to talk about what we're going to talk about next. So uh, we'll continue lecturing on chapter 13, uh, 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14 on Wednesday. Maybe we'll get through it and maybe get into chapter 15 or 16. Again, a reminder, the exam then would be one week from today. And we'll take it like we've been doing during lecture time. And then that will leave us, believe it or not, one more day after that. So we are down to uh, this week, which is Monday and Wednesday, next week, Monday and Wednesday, and Wednesday. So today is gone. So probably, uh, obviously, we'll do chapter 14, maybe 15 or 16. We'll get into maybe 16 at that point, and we'll, we'll go out of order. Uh, we're going to have the exam on next Monday, and then we'll finish up what's left, 15 and 16 at that point. And obviously, this would be our final exam. So we are down to literally one, two, three days and a final. That's not too bad. And then the semester is over, I suppose. Any questions on any of that there? OK, 